I put this on his coffin. It's his pride and joy. Still smells like him. It sucks, man. That's all you got left to your family. I love it. I like it. You know, it's been good to me. I've had my ups and downs, but this is where everything I've ever had has been. Riding bikes, four wheelers, fishing and stuff. Oh, you're in heaven. And you know, this is home. I was, I tell you, when I was 18 years old, I was that guy. So I'm leaving on this football scholarship and I ain't never coming back, you know? And uh, I went and did WVU for two years and shh, take me home. Nice neighborhood, good people. Great place to raise kids. They had a little freedom, but everybody kind of kept their eye on everybody's kids, and it was a wonderful place to raise children. My childhood was great. I had a good childhood. My dad was a coal miner. My mom, she's a RN nurse, so I was spoiled. We had anything we wanted. Oceana is just an extremely complex contradiction. It is this incredibly beautiful place with a huge population of amazing people with big hearts and so much love to go around. There's this darkness that has come over it that has affected all those things. I mean, I think in a way it's even affected the natural beauty of this place because as a person that lives here, I almost can't look at it the same um, because of, and pe people don't trust each other like they used to because there's now, there's more crime and there's more 
it, that you're getting this much more us against them mentality and um it is it's it's um, incredible and amazing and awful all at the same time it started happening i guess probably uh 10 15 years ago um i don't know if it started with over prescribing or i mean because when i was a kid um there was always the kid that smoked pot. And it, smoking pot and drinking was about all anybody ever did. And now it's the, the uh, they experiment with so many pills. And most of them are synthetic. And they are very addictive and it's taken a generation of our kids. I always pictured high school to be like the stereotypical thing, you know, swirlies, all that shit. Even like the days confused, paddle the freshmen, shit like that. Instead, it was uh, like you would walk down the hall and kids would just slap you a pill in your hand. When the prescription drug pill, Oxycontin, hit the market, the whole game changed. People started ripping each other off. They started breaking into people's homes and stuff to feed their addictions. That, to me, has been the biggest uh, downfall of the area. It's an epidemic here. I mean, anybody you could talk to here will tell you that they've at least dabbled in something. They might not have gotten addicted to it, but they'd, they've at least fooled around with it. Why here? Because um, there's nothing to do. Because this is such a small place. I mean, you look around, there's mountains everywhere. I mean, in big cities, they've got movie theaters and like malls and stuff like that. We don't have anything like that to go and just do something. I had a group of friends that there was about five or six of us. And uh, in high school, we ran around all time together. And uh, I'm just telling you, they weren't the best for picking up chicks with, cause I'll tell you, they was all about 300 damn pounds. But <laughs> we'd go out, man, and we'd ride up in the woods and shit. And sometimes, you know, we'd have a 12-pack or whatever, and we'd be riding around just, you know, and that was fun. That's what we enjoyed doing and shit. And, you know, a lot of people was out to look good, pick up girls and stuff. Man, we had good, genuine fun back in. And then, you know, there just comes a point where some people, that just ain't enough, you know? I mean, I guess some people just gotta push it as far as they can push it. And then that's when you're at a party or something and somebody, you know, hands you over here, they got pills chopped out or something like that, you know? And that's, that's what we got around here, the devil, pills. I mean, we got the Oxys, the Xanaxes, and it just completely changes people. Yeah, man, that's all this area is, the drugs, fucking. I mean, you got your parties on your weekends, fucking no high school students, college people coming around partying, drinking shit. But more than anything, this place is consumed of fucking dope and shit. Nothing to do around here. I mean, if you want to go to fucking watch a movie, bowl, and any kind of shit like that, you got to drive fucking 45 minutes, that's fucking dope. 45 minutes an hour, so fucking if you're sitting in town bored, well, what the fuck you want to do? Hell, man, let's go get hot. Let's go smoke a joint. Let's drink a few beers. I mean, you think I shit has to do. <laughs> I mean, it's... it's I think I should know it's boring around here unless you, you gotta make your own party. <laughs> well, I got two weeks before I deliver, having a little boy, a little miniature him. <laughs> a little, ju little juggalo. Yeah, that's what he's gonna come out listening to, probably. More like <laughs> <laughs> You're on drugs severely hard, or you work in the mines all day long, or you have a pot to piss in, and that's all you've got. That's the three things that you have in this area. There's nothing, not a thing. Yeah. To hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> Just about everybody around here is on dope. I mean, growing up, 
that was normal, you know, people drinking, people smoking pot and shit. But then, I don't know, here in the past 12, 15 years, the pharmaceutical drugs is ruining people. I can tell you the people that I went to school with, I graduated in 2001, that are dead, OD'd or some shit. This is actually the number one county in the state of West Virginia with uh, the prescription, for drug prescription drug pill drug abuse. abuse. Okay. They won't agree to bring a methadone clinic here to Pineville. Yeah, because there's and so many old Christians the closest here. One is and like old people that don't believe in that. You know, yeah, that, that yeah. they think that that's worse than somebody that has to go out and hunt for pills every day just to feel normal. You know, not to catch a yeah. buzz or get messed up on. People really need it here to, because everybody is just, yeah, you know, just everybody's ruining normal. their lives. Yeah, yeah. You know. They're getting in situations. Everybody that's our age, almost like 75% of them are homeless and living with parents. Really? Yeah, Couple are. under bridges yeah, over there in Oceana. When I first come here, I had nowhere to stay. I slept in the sand right there for months with a blanket and a, a dirty old pillar that, well, you can imagine laying on one overnight in the sand, you know, but I dusted out, tried to put my stuff up there, what little bit I had. And then I went from that to a two-man tent. We set it up there and lived in it for just guessing a year, maybe a little longer than a year. But my wife would use the bathroom in this gutter right here. This is where she'd get up of the morning, come out of the tent, come right there to pee, you know. Well, I was a coal miner. When I was younger, I was a coal miner. Had anything I wanted. Coal miners make good money. But I let drugs, Put me right here. Right here is where drugs led me. Everybody's getting laid off from the mines and everybody's getting laid off from the strips and everything. Drugs is what's blooming around here. You know? I'm being honest with y'all. Y'all, I, I know I hate for y'all to be around this atmosphere because n not everybody's like this, really. Mm -hmm. Honest to God, it's not. But most people find that that's a quick dollar because everybody's one. Everybody. People you wouldn't even think of, cops even, you know? And that's the quickest dollar. Instead of getting out, doing what you gotta do, fucking digging root, washing laundry, watching people's kids, to make an honest dollar. Drugs is the next thing. If you don't work in the mines, the only other way you got to make money, even where close to working in the mines, is to sell drugs. If you don't see somebody getting up in the morning and going to work, they're selling pills, you know. Prescription drug diversion is, is a huge problem here because not only uh, does it make the drug more plentiful, but it also kind of creates a, an economy underground that's far superior to uh, a legitimate economy because most of the kids that are doing it, I mean, they're looking at service sector jobs that don't pay well, and they can make a lot of money. Yeah, I made this right here. This right here is often peeled. And like 
20, 30 minutes, man. You just go to the doctor, you pay cash, and uh, pay cash, and, and they give you the pills. I'll tell you what, I'll show you something right here. Let me find it, if I can find it. Right here. They got a doctor in Washington, D.C. now, where you pay him $1,000 a visit. Look at this bottle. He has prescribed 450 Oxycontin 30s a month. He's prescribed 15 30s a day. Take six tablets every morning, then take five tablets at 1 p.m., then take four tablets at night. 15, and this ain't all he wrote. I wish I had the other bottles. He wrote these 450 Oxy 30s a month, 200 methadone 10s, and 120 speed pills Adderall. You pay that doctor $1,000 a month, and this is what he gives you. You think of the money that was just in this bottle right here. A hundred of them is $4,000. 450 of these, Oxy 30s. For the past 10 years, I've averaged somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 teeth extractions per year. When we first opened, and I was a little bit naive about the, the drug problem as it was beginning, I think I, I probably did get taken advantage of uh, a little bit as far as, um, you know, writing prescriptions for pain medication. And But I, I learned pretty quick that, uh, you know, I was going to be not part of that problem. My dad is also addicted, and me and him kind of used together. Me and him won the lottery, $12,000. We spent it no time. One week, it was gone. We had nothing to show for it. We done 10 80s every day. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an epidemic around here, and it's, it's killing a lot of people, and it's not going to stop. It's not. For every person that you bust, three more pick it up. I feel like I'm being forced to go to a rehab. Why? Because I'm pregnant. What's the issue? Uh, I don't want them to take my kid. Why are they going to take your kid? Why don't you talk to me about it? Because I'm dirty. <laughs> I don't know, for the first two years, I was snorting them. And then, I don't know, I just seen how good everybody felt shooting them. So I started shooting up and I, four years later. <laughs> I've done, I've done horrible things for dope, like, I've, I've stuff I really don't want to talk about, but uh, just things that, that women do, you know, to get money. I was one of those people that's walking on the street down there, I was one of those people. I was scared to death at first. I was like, oh my God, I don't want to do this, you know? I was scared, I was really scared. Because my husband, the reason why he went to prison was because he was trying to support my pill habit. And I didn't have to do nothing. I sat at home all day and he went out and robbed coal mines or whatever he had to do to get us pills. So when he went to prison, I had to step up and take that responsibility up for myself or sit home and be sick. You got 19, 20 year old girls running around here that'll give oral sex, any kind of sex you want for five or ten dollars. I mean, it's horrible. Hepatitis C here, they said, is like 70 to 80 percent of this town from IV users. And that's one thing I've never done. I ain't never stuck no needles in my arm or nothing How like that. Snoring them. Oh, yeah. When was the last time you did? Just a minute ago, right when y'all walked in here. Oh, yeah. I got a whole pocket full of them right now, y'all. I got Xanaxes and Oxycontins. I like mixing them, and that's a deadly combination, too. They say not to mix them, but that's the only way I like to do them. I'll show y'all something. This is, I'll show y'all how the money is. And these blue ones right here, I mean, they don't make regular Oxycontin no more. They make Roxycontin. These are Roxy's. That's a 30 milligram Roxycodone pill. And that's anywhere from 40 to $50 around here, them are. This right here, there's an Oxy-10, the top pink. That's $15. This right here is a peak Xanax. It's a nerve pill. All right, there's about anywhere from 2 to $3. I 
I take them and mix them and snort them. How does that make you feel? Good. When the 80s, 80s was first started here. coming around, they were 120, and then because they started being recalled or whatever happened, they were like 170, 180. Yeah, you couldn't so find I'd them. I seen somebody sell one Oxycontin 80 for $200 one time, and there was like five people fighting over it. Mm -hmm. It got it got really bad. It would bad. probably take me, I'd say, probably six to eight hundred dollars to actually get high. If I was lucky, then I would actually get high per day. The CDC tells us West Virginia is the most prescription per population on an annual basis anywhere in the country. There's only 1.8 million people in the whole state. And every one of those men, women, and children get about 18 prescriptions a year. And that's probably at least 50% higher than the rest of the country. We go through 150 or so people a day here, and we'll have an overdose that probably leads to a death every day. So when you, and some of those, don't, because we're a regional command center, some of those people don't even get to us. Their EMS goes to their homes, finds that they're dead, they just call in and then, uh, and then they don't even end up in our numbers here in the emergency department. Upstairs we deliver all the babies in a five or six county area and at any given time uh, because of the drug abuse of the mothers half the babies in the nursery are on methadone. Many people have called the generation lost that in terms of lost workforce, lost education, lost, lost lives. There's a a psychological term called Appalachian fatalism uh, and uh, the, the people of Appalachia have been repeatedly taken advantage of. Uh, at, at one time local people owned all the land around us and all of the mineral rights which we now know was worth billions of dollars and once people determined that it was worth billions of dollars they came in and essentially shafted all of the locals out of all of that they've been taken advantage of by outsiders over and over again to the point that, number one, they trust almost no one from outside, and number two, they have a very fatalistic look, uh, view of their life. Grandfathers and fathers have worked in the coal mines and their bodies have broken down, and, and uh, you know, the doctors that the coal companies brought in were told, you keep them working. You, you do what you need to do to keep them working. And so they, you know, they were prescribed medication and they kept working because they were hard-working Appalachian men. And, and so there's this culture of, of um, pills are good. Pills are, pills are a positive thing. And, and um, you know, and then uh, it's just, I think, kind of progressed from, from narcotics, Tylox and Percocet that were abused recreationally. And when Oxycontin came on the scene, I think people thought it was the same kind of drug. And all of a sudden they were, they were taking a huge step up addiction-wise. And they, they were just addicted like that. My name is James Robert Lewis. Uh, they call me Bobby. This is my wife, Shadow Lewis. Um, uh, I have a problem. I, I have cancer, and I've been on drugs since I was 12 years old. But I've been on oxycodone for since 2007. Um, I, I have an addic addiction. Plus, I'm fighting cancer too. So these are two, two 15. I'm getting ready to do one for me and one for my wife. This how I do it. This is not going to make me higher, or I'm not going to be falling over, and nothing of that sort. This is just to keep me from being sick throughout the day. And I have brain cancer now, is, is where it's at, that, at, at now. Now it went from my stomach to, to my, my head. head. They, they've given me six months to live t twice, and I went through the chemo, uh, chemo and radiation in P Pittsburgh, and they're wanting to take me back to, uh, take me back into Morgantown now. 
to 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 do, to, to do for, for my head and truthfully morgantown is they don't have no bedside manners it's all st students and they don't care about no, no nobody and, and that's what it well, I'll, I'll, I'll let them operate on my back or my hip or whatever on my stomach again, but I'll never, ne ne never let them operate on my hip. They want to drill two holes right, right here and one in the back of my, behind my ear. There's nobody that can take me except for God. But, but I believe in God. I'm not, I know I'm not doing right, but what I'm sitting here, here doing, but this is how they do you in the hospital. I'm not going to lie to you. They come around with a pill and you swallow it, or they come around with a shot and inject it to your IV. I mean, it's nothing that they don't do. But there's nothing here except for drugs and a coma. It's all it's in, in this little town. Yeah. They call it Oxiana. I mean, it's the name, name of it, Oxiana. I mean, there's, needless to say, that there's more dope in this little town than I've seen in some parts of this city. For, for, for real. I mean, that's the honest uh, uh, truth. There's more dope in this little town than there is in some places in the city. Oceana used to be such a wonderful place to live, and, and now you're almost ashamed to say you're from Oceana because people say Oxiana. And that's pretty much what it's become. I've seen eight, nine, ten year old kids shooting dope. Two, 70, 80. 90-year-old people, you know, older people, shooting dope. If it wasn't for drugs in this town, in my opinion, there wouldn't be no town. It's just so prevalent here that it's hard for us to keep track. One time, Last summer, I literally had to tell the drug task force to stop making buys because we couldn't keep up with the paperwork. You know, we are in an unfortunate consequence where the people that we either want to help who are addicted or that we are after because they're dealers are killing themselves off. I had a whole folder of them. Right here. Born 83, June 25th, 83, died. April 2nd, 2010, overdosed. There's another picture of a girl that died, overdosed. It was a friend of mine. That's one of the pictures I had her at her funeral. She died, overdosed. I mean, the list goes on, man. The list goes on. You know, half of my graduating class is dead because of pills, and I'm 23 years old. Like two years after I graduated, I think six of my friends passed away due to prescription drugs. And um, uh, last year, I helped bury three of my best friends due to drugs. And um, it, it's, it's sad, man. It's sad that, you know, they had kids, some of them had kids, and those kids will never be able to live down the fact that their dad OD'd, you know, and that, that breaks my heart. My best friend, Perky, man, when I was, uh, you know, since I was, what year did he die? I don't know, Joey. I wasn't with you then. I mean, we grew up together all mm. our lives, man. And he was a petroleum engineer, went to WVU for four years, got a degree in petroleum engineering, mm. and got got a killer job, you know. And uh, this doctor had hooked him up on on the oxys and stuff. And he didn't live about a year past that, man. And he OD'd and died. We've known a lot and I, of people. And he today. was my best friend. He's like my brother, dude. I've lost two really close people to, to appeals, you know? And, and when you go look at them there in that casket, and know they're never gonna, they're never gonna breathe again. They're never gonna make you laugh again. You're never gonna get a talk or hang out again. And, and it's all because of that. I mean, that sucks, I hate that. But it's hard to cry because it's not your fault. You wouldn't have had it that way. Every person I know personally knows somebody who has OD'd and died. Um, my my girls have uh, a close friend who his mother OD'd and died. The, everybody knows some. It's not like you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Everybody has somebody that's 
relatively close to them that has OD'd and died. And when that is your reality, it's scary to think, oh, well, you know, maybe my kid's just going to go smoke a joint or something, but what's after that? When people die around here, and they say, oh, they've been oxycuted. Huh. I mean, you got a 20-year-old kid dies, oh, he's been oxycuted. Fuck it, he done it to himself. I, you know, they don't care. What the fuck? Me and her work, work out together about shit. Fucking, I tried to hide it from her for about a month, so. Right. And then when she seen me snort my first pill, you know, I told her straight up, I was like, no, I'll do shit if I got with you. I'm gonna keep continue to do it. If you wanna be with me, cool. If not, I'll take you home right now. And she hung around there. What was that like for you? It was, uh, I wasn't expecting it, because I always said that I wouldn't be with anybody who would do that kind of stuff, because I didn't want, I didn't want to get into it. I didn't want my family to look down on me as if I was a bad person for being with somebody. But I loved them and still do, even though you get mean sometimes. The thing but. is, people look portray you a different way. Fucking yeah. they think just because you do up, you're a bad, you're a sorry son of a bitch, you're a bad motherfucker, and they don't get, you're nothing to the society or nothing. And all it is, you're a fucking addict, you can't fucking help it. I mean, if I could, I'd quit shit today, wouldn't want to think about another fucking pill. But fucking, when it gets to the point where you're laying in the fucking bed, fucking cold, shaking, fucking sweating, mm -hmm. fucking can't fucking move, and all that's on your fucking mind is that fucking pill, you just don't give a fuck no more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got to the point where fucking, it barely fucking kill me. And fucking, I've thought about stupid shit, but fucking, I start thinking a little bit rationally about shit, and so I try to bring myself out of it. But then, you know, something happens, you get money, you get something worked up, get my pill, I'm happy. I mean, I think she's seen me, I'm a mean son of a bitch some days, and fucking, you know, you don't talk to me, you don't be around me. So I still think it set me off and I'll fly off the fucking handle. I'm but still then, with you though. But then as soon as I get my fucking pill, I'm happy, I'm a good motherfucker. I mean, I try to keep it like that, but it's hard. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> <laughs>
Pay forty five dollars for it. One fucking pill. I'm gonna do them, shoot it up. Put a whole unit of water on it. Usually, usually with these, you gotta fucking, you gotta cold shoot, cold shoot these. The other ones, you can throw a little heat to them with these, throw heat down, they'll job on you and just waste your fucking dope. back no you're in there if I should wrote forty five dollars then you everybody do a second off of it so you can get all your dope up and after your seconds then it's pretty much done and over with That's why it's fucking so fucking. Everybody likes it. It's a tiny sleep fucking hit you. You're fucking. Fucking cramps, hurting, everything goes away. Just that fast. There are times that whenever we're down to like our last bit of money, he'll be sick. And I don't like seeing him sick. Um, I've seen him go through the cold sweats and thrown up and all that stuff, and I, it worries me because I've heard about the dangers of people coming off of it, they could die from it, and I, I, I'm I, scared to death of that happening all the time. So I'll tell him to take our last little bit of money that we've got and go get him some. It's like if he goes a day without it, he turns into a totally different person to the point where I don't even want to be near him. But I know that I got to be there for him. So it's one of those lose-lose situations, and it just makes it so difficult. Um, it also scares me because with the baby on the way, I don't know, like if the baby decides that it's going to be cranky one day and he's sick, I'm scared that he's just going to blow up and just take off somewhere and I won't see him for the rest of the day or whatever. Jason pretty much drives me crazy. I've offered to take him to rehab. He, he won't go. Uh, he says he'll go, he'll get cleaned up, and when that's over, he'll just go right back. And of course, we've had the talks about that kind of attitude, and, and but I think for the most part, he's being pretty truthful with me about that. Um, but he's got trouble with the law, and um, you know, he, him and Chelsea are living in her grandmother's house. It's not his. He doesn't have a job, and he's got a baby on the way. How responsible is that? Yeah, beg, 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 her to ne ne never, d d never, ever do this now. And, and I, and I said one night I was. Just out of prison, prison, that was before I ever had any of my operations or anything. And she was fresh here, and that's after she had done whoop me in front of my friends and everything. She she, she was sitting at the house one night, and I, do, do, I was doing a shot. She walked in while I was doing a shot and cut. She, and she said, well, I if you're going to, she, she, she said, well, she left, and then she came back, and then she, she seen me doing it again. And she said, well, if you're, you're going to do it, What's I'm going to so do it, and I be so begged her, this? and I even cried. I, I begged her and begged her, please don't do this, and, and I wouldn't hit, hit her. And she sat down after, because she, she had seen how I'd done it and seen other people, how, how they done it. And she sat down and fixed it up, and she started poking herself, and there was blood, blood running everywhere, and she had 10 or 15 uh, holes in her, and I, I finally gave in and s said, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and hit you.
I get prescribed pretty strong medication because my daddy has beat on me. It's not like everybody else. I don't want to come off like everybody else around here is on dope. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is around here, and I know that. And it sounds so bad of me. <sighs> but I'm on oxycodone 15 and oxycodone hour fives for boosters, and I'm on Xanaxes. And I don't, I don't have time for my back to hurt. I don't have time for my, my neck to hurt. I have a little girl that is into everything. My pain medicine, honest to God, helps me function. I don't abuse my medication. I take them like I'm supposed to. Because, hell, I need them, you know? I got anxiety and depression. And I ain't gonna lie, every now and then I get a little fucking crazy. <laughs> I first started doing pills because I seen Kayla, my cousin, she lost, I used to be like really big. And she started doing pills and she lost like 80 pounds like really quick. I lost like almost 100 pounds in four months. Yeah. And I was happy then, <laughs> but I didn't know I was gonna get hooked on pills like that. I don't know, me and somebody robbed this dude. <laughs> took, took like $1,500, $1,600 from him. And we took off for the night. We got a bunch of pills and we got a bunch of coke and hung out in Beckley. And the first time I shot up, it was Oxycontin, the, the ones that they made, you know, they used to make, the OC ones. And it was just the best feeling in the world. Like, I just fell in love with it. It's a love-hate relationship. I mean, it's a plain fact of the truth about it. I mean, I love it because of the way it makes me feel and how it takes everything away, but I hate it because of what it's doing to me and what it's doing to people around me. Because at that time, I, I always said, no, it ain't affecting nobody, it's affecting myself, but it's affecting everybody around me too, my family, my friends. I got that baby on the way, and I want to try to start doing right by it. But fucking, hell, man, fucking, no, I, I tried it. And like I said, I go like two or three days, and that'd be, I mean, you know, Chelsea, one night I was in there, fucking, I mean, it's hot as fuck up in here, and I was back there fucking shivering, shaking, fucking shirt was sucking wet. I mean, I felt like I was on my fucking deadbed. And then, just luckily, a buddy of mine fucking loaned me fucking $40, and I went down Pineville, got me a fucking 30 and. Since I got home and done, I fucking I was up moving around, jumping, Judy, fucking just you no know, fucking you like, damn, who the hell is this motherfucker? I mean, <laughs> you didn't think nothing about shit. You have to have it. You'll do anything to get it. And so you'll go and you'll sit with this old man that sells drugs because if you sit with him long enough, then he'll just keep handing you thirties, eighties, coke, whatever you want. And you know what he's wanting. In your head, you know what he's wanting, but it's even like it doesn't even don't matter. Give it. it doesn't even matter because as long as you're getting, as long as he's feeding those pills to you and you're getting them, matter. you don't even think about that. You don't think about the consequences in your head whatsoever once you're getting them. None. Whatsoever. You don't, it doesn't hit you until after the fact, until after you're sober. The last thing you think of before you go to sleep at night is how can I get me a fix in the morning? And when your eyes first open up that morning, that's the first thing you think of is how am I gonna get it? And one way or another, you'll get it if I have to take it. Now, I've never went and armed and robbed nobody or beat up nobody, but uh, I'd trick you, I'd say, uh, you got any more of them for sale? Yeah, well here, sell me two. Well, when he gets his bottle out, and I'm gone. I'm convicted of two murders. Who's going to come under here and bother me? I mean, not bragging. It's a shame. I'm ashamed. I'm not bragging to you. I'm ashamed of, you know, the lifestyle I've lived, you know. Is it scary living around here because of yeah. the Yeah. You never. I'm surprised them speakers and stuff haven't got stolen yet because, and that PlayStation 3. Because there's so many thieves around here, honestly. People think, I mean, people that you think that would be your best friend, people that's been there for you, 
through thick and thin, you think that they'd be there for you. But they'd be the one to fuck you over the most. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her we met. When I first seen her, 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 her in, in prison, I walked to, over to her. I put my hand up under her chin. I told her, I said, as long, 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 long as you're with me, you'll keep your, your head held high. I broke down when my dad passed away. In my senior year of high school, I had a nervous breakdown, but I worked it through it. And I know it's going to be probably the hardest or harder of me when he does pass away, but I can handle it. I know that God has not put me nothing. I have. I have God has not put nothing on me. I can't fight in life, and I know this. I'm going to miss him, and I promise him from the day we've got together, that I'd always be here to take care of his mom, and that's what I will do. And I won't walk away. I haven't walked away since, you know, we got married. He thought he was gonna lose me after when he went back to prison, and I didn't leave then. And I know when God does take him, I won't leave. And this, Bobby is my special one in my life. It says, someone special, the most beautiful thing in the world are not singing, what's that word? The most beautiful th thing in I've the world are right. not not seen nor nor touched. Not the, seen, the, touched. These are feelings with my heart, and Bobby is my heart. I've never had self-esteem, never had nothing, and when he walked in my life, I always thought I was fat and ugly. And I am a big girl. I've been heavy since I've been born, but I can say God put me here for me, and now I can say thanks to my husband. I love myself now. I never loved myself before because my mom hated me and she still hates me. But there's nothing I can't get through because I got a great mother-in-law and I got a great husband. Six weeks. She's six weeks old. Right on. I'm a mean dog. No, stop. You're not getting down. When I graduated high school, I had a nursing license, I had a brand new car, I had got married, I had anything I wanted. Within three months after I had my child, I was addicted to the needle. In one day, my husband went to prison. The following day, my car got repossessed before I got out of the bed. The following day, my child was taken. So within three days, I, went, I lost everything I ever loved in my life. And it just got to where I could care less if I lived or died. I mean, the only thing I'd done, I, w I woke up every day to do pills. That's it. My mom used to tell me, your kids don't even mean enough to you to stop doing drugs. And she's right. Once you get on them, your kids don't, nothing means nothing to you. I mean, the only thing you care about is a pill. And that's... It completely you know, takes over yeah, you. Yeah, it's like, it's like a, a demon that's inside you that you can't get out for nothing. And it controls your life. You don't have control of your life no more. It controls it completely. I'm going to show you which I may not should, but I'm gonna show you what I do. This is one thing that I can honestly say that turned me around to, to being a better person. This is called a suboxone. What I do of the mornings, I'll take and I'll bend this in half. Some people take the knife, but I just, close enough, I'll turn it two. I'll save that one. But I'll take that, and which I got dentures. <laughs> it's hard to do with dentures, but I fold it up, just like I am right here. And all I do with that is lay it under my tongue. And that's it. It takes all the craving from drugs away. I don't want Oxycontin no more, but I crave these. If I ain't got one of these a day, I'm just as dope sick as if I didn't have a shot of dope.
It's getting bad. Like, you really can't trust a lot of people. People rob old people for they their come medicine. Out of pharmacy. Like, old people that come out of the pharmacy, they'll just hit them and beat them to death and then take whatever they got. It could be high blood pressure medicine. Or it just, it don't matter to, to people. It's just getting to the point where it's getting bad. I mean, people just, a turn up missing in a couple weeks or a couple months down the road. They'll find them in an old sewage pond or down Artie Bailey Lake or, I mean, it, it just depends. People say, well, they was ratting and then all of a sudden they're gone and then they find their bones somewhere. My grandma freaks out because over in Matheny, they found like bones of I don't think it was one or two of them girls that was missing from Oceana. And all they found was their bones that dogs have been chewing on. My grandma says, I don't care what they done. They didn't deserve that. My brother was murdered. He was found behind this house in a pool uh, nine months after he disappeared. He was tied down with cinder blocks around his neck and stuff. And uh, Chess was a big man, 6'3", 6'4", 260, 270, and he was a rough old boy. I don't think no one person took him from the front. At the same time period he disappeared, two females and another guy disappeared in about a two and a half week period, all of them within a four to five mile radius of each other. And this is a small community, which you can see, and it's just real odd. Maybe they were partying together and things just got out of hand. Ever since I lost my family, I just, I don't know, it's like a piece of me's been dead ever since. And I just feel like, you know, you gotta live life to its fullest. You might as well speak your mind and let people know. And don't, you know, don't take people for granted either because when I left my mom and dad's house that day, everybody was loving on me, you know, tell you you love you. I told them I loved them and then I, I, I left and I come back up that morning and bring my daddy's check and every one of them was dead, man. I went up to my parents' house, it was on a, a Saturday. I went back to my mom's bedroom and I uh, was talking to her. And she wanted me to order a pizza. I was at late off time, we didn't have no money. She wanted me to order a pizza and get her some cigarettes down the road. They didn't have a vehicle. Well, she gave me the money. And my dad was acting funny as hell because my mom, uh, I was in the bedroom with her and she kept saying, be quiet, he's listening. I was like, what the hell? Well, I jumped up off the bed and walked to the bedroom door. He took off running from the door. He'd be listening to us, you know, acting paranoid as hell. But anyway, I left. She gave me $40 that day. I, act, I got on the phone and acted like I called and ordered her pizza and shit. Left and went and bought me a pill, bought me a couple of Oxy 40s. And, uh, but my dad told me when I left, they didn't have a vehicle. He said, go pick up my check in the morning, my miner's pension check. He was calling me all his life. I said, okay, I'll be up about 10 o'clock, Dad. Well, I left there. I told him I loved him. I got to see my brother. Last time I ever seen him was like five minutes. He came out of his bedroom. He said, you know, I love you. I'll see you here in a minute. We can bring the pizza back. I left and uh, come back up right next morning. And I seen methadone pills laying all over the counter. I was like, what the hell? Because Dad usually kept them on him, you know, like gold to him. And they, uh, I started tiptoe over there. I was going to try to get me a couple of them. I looked over in the corner, and my dad was sitting there, and he had dried blood. It was already dried down the side of his head. I looked at him, I said, what do you do? You fucked up and fall and hit your head? And uh, he never moved. And uh, I looked down, and I looked down, and he's left-handed. He's sitting in a chair. He's like, he's right here sitting in a chair. His head was there. And his hand was like his. Well, I looked down, and there was a pistol laying. It was my brother's pistol. It was laying facing him, and I thought, my damn heart just dropped. And I said, oh, God. I said, Mom, Chad. I started yelling for my mom and my brother, and nobody had answered. <coughs> but anyway, I know they was dead, but I had to see myself, man. I went to my brother's room. He was laying halfway off his bed. He had a blanket. Dad had put a blanket on him from his waist over top of him. I didn't have enough guts to lift the blanket off of him. I know he was gone. Anyway, uh, 
anyway, I left that room, and I guess where I was in such a state of shock, when I left his room, I went to my mother's room, and bless her heart, man, she had multiple sclerosis. She was in real bad shape. She was dying. And she was laying in a fetal position with her hands like this and her eyes closed and a blanket on her. She never knew what hit her. He shot her while she was asleep, point blank rain. But uh, I got in the room, it was dark in there. I couldn't see real good. I started shaking her leg. I was like, Mom, Mom, get up, Mom. I said, get up, Mom. And she never moved. And I turned the light on in the bedroom. When I turned the light on in the bedroom, I seen where he shot her in the head. And her, whole, her whole pillow was saturated with blood. I mean, and the sad thing about it was, I left, I didn't know what to do, I was in shock. I left and I went to the bottom of the driveway. And when I went to the bottom of the driveway, this is January 31st, brother, it's cold up here. I had no shirt on, I was in a pair of shorts and no shoes. I guess I'd freaked out so bad. And these cars going in there, I was hollering, I was flagging, please stop, help me, somebody stop, help me. Everybody's going on by, they thought I'd went crazy, a madman or something. I talked to people later, but nobody stopped, so I had to go back up there, go back in and get the phone that was sitting with my dad. I just turned my head and I grabbed the phone. And uh, I, I noticed then when I grabbed the phone, you know, that picture of my daughter up there, uh, my dad was holding a little wallet size picture of her in his hand. Uh, we kind of found out, I found out the reason uh, he covered my brother up with that blanket. He'd shot my brother in the eye. I guess he couldn't stand to look and see what he'd done. He shot my brother four times. He shot my mother three times. And I'll go ahead and be honest, this might piss some family off or whatever. And the cops don't know it either, but my mom was prescribed oxys, right? My brother would keep him in his safe away from my dad. When I found my baby brother laying on halfway off his bed, he was spraddled out like this. And both my mom's scripts was laying at the tips of his finger, her script bottles. So I suppose they got in an argument and he killed them over. So I guess, you know, I hate anybody to look at my dad and say that he killed my family over pills or whatever, but that's what they do to you, man. They made him crazy.
Psalms 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he, he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. He, he's my life. I mean, he, he, it's a, I, don't, I don't praise nobody else, or, and, I, and I thank him every night, night for letting me live another day. And, I, and I, nine times out of ten, I, I thank him every morning for letting me wake up because I'm not prom promised. I, I hang on because of the, these two, two. I'm not much, but I hang on for these two. two, two. I'm going to until I can't no more. I mean, my ex-husband kept me alive while I was OD'ing. Did you want to die? Yeah. Why? Because my kids were not in my life. And I was in, I was away from them. And that's, that's why I really am on drugs, is because of it. It's my crutch with my kids. Yeah, I mean, if y'all had just any, like, a quarter of the addiction that we've been through, man, you, you would understand completely. You'd be like, you wouldn't even ask that question. You, you'd still be like, damn, why am I still alive today? Fuck, you know. What's Nobody's that? going to care, you know. This is West Virginia. I think we're all a bunch of inbred pieces of shit, you know. People's actually trying, you know, we can't get nowhere. It, it just sucks, man. You can't have a beer. You want your passy? I'm gonna be straight up. I am a white girl in this world trying to make it. And that's all I am. And that's all I want ever be, as far as I see it. But I want better for my young one. If it wasn't for me getting hurt, I wouldn't be here. I know for a fact I wouldn't be in this area. There's nothing here. There's nothing here to grow up on. I want something better than what I got. I want her to grow up thinking the world is her oyster and whatever she wants to do, she can't. I don't want her to be left back or limited because she's from West Virginia. I used to be the most laid back person in the world carefree, hung out. I tell you what, I went to my mom and dad's every single day. This lives two minutes from here. I'd walk up there or drive up there and see them every single day. I was a very happy person, and uh, that happened, and I'm not happy, man. How, how can you be happy when you lost? I mean, I lost everything, man. I'm not fucking happy. And I sit up here by myself. I sit and look at them pictures and just sit and dwell on the shit. Think about what all drugs has done. It is a struggle. It's like an alcoholic. Every time he passes that beer cooler, he thinks, boy, him tasted good. Well, every time I see somebody doing dope, I think, boy, I remember the rush I got off that. But I block it out and, you know, I love to go through this program and have my kid and just have a normal life. Like, even if I got to work at McDonald's or something like that, just, you know, it's a normal life. Like, I don't have to worry about dope. But it's just living in this area. It's just, it's everywhere. Can you have a normal life here? No. No. It's, it's just not possible. It's, it's in your face everywhere you go. I hope every day my kid don't want to go. I don't want my kid to go through this. At all, at all. I would never wish this on anybody. I would not wish this on anybody. I wish everybody could, you know, have the same mindset that, that you know, have a, a good, happy, clean life, you know, not need stuff like that. But it's just not that way, and it's hard. It's hard to explain because they're just, 
there's no saving some of these people. I have to tell my kids all the time, look, a lot of the stuff that happens here is not, it's just not normal. That's just not the way that it is in a lot of other places. And sometimes you get, you get scared and frustrated and you say, man, I just want to get out of here, you know? I just like to take my kids and, and get out of here, but... But I, lo I love this place. And I love the people here. And I guess I don't, I don't have solutions. I don't know what to do. It's like he didn't kill me that day, but he did, you know what I mean? I feel, to be honest with you, I feel like I'm just waiting for my turn. And I feel like, you know, I don't know how y'all are atheists, believe in God or whatever, but I believe when I go, that, you know, if there's a hell, I know my dad's there. But I believe when I go that my mom and my brother will be waiting there on me. Sometimes that's what I want. I'm not suicidal. I never kill myself. I'm scared to death of dying. But I feel like the soul got sucked out of me that day. I tell you that. I just, I don't know. I'm dying to sniff some right now. The only thing I know is their war on drugs ain't working at all. They need a totally new approach. We're spending billions of dollars, and what are we getting out of it? Just more problems. Did you see Jason when he was tiny? Yeah. Right here. Little guy. <laughs> At one time, he was a little guy. I don't do anything. I take my Plyvix and uh, blood pressure pill. That's it. That's all I take. And I'll tell them when they're like, my knees are hurting, I'm take you and leave. Take you a Tylenol. Don't cut it. It should. That's in your head. Well, not when you've been on stuff. Uh, it's still, it's in your head. You better tolerance of stuff and little stuff don't cut. Well, but if you went to rehab <laughs> and got educated on your disease. I know my stuff. I think Jason is being jatty. Yeah. I don't think he does it every day. But if he's got money, he'll do it. Because he does, he binges a lot. That's what really scares me. Because binge addicts are more likely to die of an overdose. I hate the idea of hurting my family. I can help it though. It is hot. It's got to do it feel normal. <laughs> I told you I'd take you to rehab. I told you I'd get you in a rehab. I can't afford the methadone clinic, Jason, but I'll get you in a rehab. It's a lot easier than I've done. <laughs> well, you're going to have to, baby, or somebody else is going to end up raising that child for you. I don't know if it pissed me off. Well, baby, nobody can do it but you. Because if I could do it for you, it would have been done. Quit today, I would, but it ain't that simple. No, I'll get it worked out. I always seem to somehow. Yeah, for now. Yeah, for now, for now it works. Well, like I said, I'll take you to a rehab. Yeah, I'll come down to that. I'll buy you cigarettes while you're there. I'll get you underwear, socks, whatever you need, pajamas, whatever. But I can't do it for you.
I get busted again, I get 15 to life. One, two times. Do you care? Yeah, I care. What kind of dad will I be sitting up there talking to my daughter behind a glass? You know, I'd rather, I'll tell you the truth, you might think I'm crazy, but uh, I'm not going back to jail. I'm not. They have to kill me. I'm just not going back. I've done my time. I'm not going back. They have to kill me. I promise you. You might even hear about it on the news. The motherfuckers come out there after me. I don't know about you this. They're aiming for a rude awakening because I'm not fucking going back. Behind my brown eyes, you see only tears. Only if you look closer, you can revere my fears. If you look at my arms under my shirt, all you see is cuts and wonder how much it hurts. I'm torn from one place to another. Why is that only the one that loves me is my mother? Why must my dad left this life so short? It makes me wonder if I would have ever wound it up in court. As I lay here just thinking of the days, how could I have done such a good job of pissing them away? I'd like to look at it as my journey just beginning, but why does every day seem like it's just the ending? Thank you.